Good afternoon and welcome uh, to the final lecture in Law, Politics, and Media uh, lecture series that we have this spring. Uh, this lecture series is uh, co-sponsored by the Institute for the Study of Judiciary, Politics, and Media, uh, which I direct. My name is Keith Bybee, and the Tully Center for Free Speech, uh, directed by Roy Gutterman. And I have no more words left for Roy Gutterman. That's a, he's like just like it's here. It's you know I. I promised this wouldn't happen, and here it is happening, but Roy Gutterman, right there. These speakers also participate in a class called Law, Politics, and Media, which is a co-taught venture uh, between the College of Law, Maxwell School, and the Newhouse School. Uh, it is taught by Roy, uh, myself, and Lisa Dolak, a professor here at the Law School. We've had uh, eight speakers uh, this semester, and uh, we have saved for last, because he is the best, Gene Koo. Uh, Gene is executive director of iCivics. Uh, the title of his talk is Civics, the Internet, and the Art of Self-Government. iCivics is an organization that was founded by uh, Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor to educate and engage a new generation of American citizens. As executive director, Gene oversees all organizational activities with a primary focus on aligning operations and strategy with organizational vision, achieving large-scale adoption, and securing long-term sustainability. Uh, that means that he also raises money, right? So he may be asking people before the hour is up. Uh, prior to joining the iCivics team, Gene developed a new media strategies to connect nonprofit organizations with their grassroots constituencies. He was a fellow at Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society. And when he was there, he brought web-based uh, innovation into law school classrooms. He designed virtual worlds for civic engagement. Uh, Gene also co-founded the nation's first uh, online skills training program for legal aid attorneys. He holds a, a JD and a BA from Harvard, and he was, uh, many years ago, uh, a student in my class. I uh, reflected uh, my pedagogical methods on him, uh, and uh, he's lived to tell the tale. Probably the worst was a joke I used to tell every year, and Gene heard it. I dropped it because it was so bad, but in Gene's honor, I will tell this oh, joke. Boy. Yes. So what is the difference between illegal and unlawful. Unlawful means abrogation of statute, and illegal is a sick bird. It's a joke. It's a play, on, play on words. Okay, so um, I for one am glad to have Gene back. Uh, and before I welcome him to the podium, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about uh, how we're going to proceed here. Uh, Gene's going to talk for about 30 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll have Q&A with the audience. At 5 o'clock, we'll have a reception right here in uh, this room. We'll be uh, bringing in food and drink, and I invite everybody to stay, uh, not only for the refreshments, but to continue conversation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Gene Koo. Uh, Keith forgot to mention that I also uh, was a TA in your in your undergrad con law class while I was also taking con law at law school, so I got to in, in turn inflict your pedagogical methods onto undergrads <laughs> myself. So System thank works. you for that opportunity. It was also uh, one of my one of my great teaching opportunities and one of the ways in which I was able to really live out uh, some of my my uh, love of teaching while I was stuck in law school. Um, so uh, is this is this my water or is this water? Uh, this is your water. Oh, okay. Matt. I have a toddler at home, so I'm probably immune to anything at this point. I can just drink that and be <laughs> perfectly fine. Um, so uh, you gave me a very uh, broad uh, canvas to, to, um, to work off of, and I think today what I'm going to focus on a little bit more, although I'm happy to go off into other directions with your input, um, is really looking at uh, really the, the opportunities afforded to us by new media, and very specifically video games, but then also generally other new media and civic engagement and what that really means for us in the 21st century. Um, if I can get this to work, indeed. Okay, all right. So this is, uh, this is a completely different deck for the one person here who was at my previous talk. So uh, I can always switch back when, it, when you get bored with this one. Um, but iCivics, as, as Keith had introduced, uh, we help teachers empower the next generation of engaged citizens and mm -hmm. uh, we do that through a whole variety of different uh, strategies. We're best known for our video games, it's kind of our marquee product, and we have 17 of them that cover all sorts of topics through branches of government, um, 
you know, basically all these different topics on how government works are traditionally think of as civics, um, but also uh, getting involved and in, engaged in civic society. So uh, things like jury duty uh, or uh, how to, you know, some basics on organizing and, and, and activism. Um, actually, this is out of date. We've been played over 7 million times. Uh, Do I Ever Write is our most popular game. It's been played 2 million times. And if you have an iPad and you know, don't want to haul out your laptop, you can get it for free. Uh, for the iPad is Pocket Law Firm, and as I mentioned before, the latest game we have is, is called We the Jury. We have another one coming out uh, this in just a few weeks in collaboration with, there's a new um, PBS series called The Constitution, or actually it's called Constitution USA with Peter Sagal. Um, and I think that's actually the official title Peter Sagal had in the contract that his name is in there. So um, we have a game coming out in collaboration with that uh, about federalism, which is the topic that bores everybody to death. And we've somehow figured out a way to turn that into a game, so that'll be number 18, and that's coming out in collaboration with that TV series. Uh, so enough with the commercials. Um, <clears throat> let me just talk a little bit about, you know, why video games, what's actually interesting about them as a medium, uh, and then uh, we can, you know, branch out into other forms of new media. But I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff here for those of us who uh, care about uh, civil society, um, and as well as education. So first, from an educational perspective, uh, games are really great at uh, capturing uh, all sorts of processes that you know, don't otherwise fit into uh, traditional ways of teaching. Um, and so when you look, when, when we approach a topic at iCivics, and let me just back up and say that what we are specifically, we specifically work with middle school age children our uh, target audience, uh, it's, it, all of our materials are developed around a seventh grade reading level. Uh, so about half of the folks using our materials are in that middle school range. Another quarter are in upper high school because that's really where civics has been kind of ghettoized. Um, and part of our mission is to try to get civics back into, you know, in a real way, back into middle schools and maybe even younger. Uh, and the remaining quarter of our users are all over the place. We've heard about folks using it in, in junior college. We actually just got an email uh, from uh, a faculty member at a school that will not be named, it is not this school, where the uh, outgoing president of one of the academic councils was uh, finally admitted that she plays our um, video game about being the president in her off hours. Uh, and so as the kind of the, the, the big gag gift for her, they're printing up a, 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 a t-shirt for her with that game on it. So we're all the way up in academia itself. Uh, being played across the spectrum, but it's really, you know, the, the, the target audience is seventh grade uh, or, or middle school. Um, and one of the strengths of uh, video games as a medium when you compare it to all of the other media, and, and so when we develop our materials, we really try to make sure that the way we are teaching uh, match, the pedagogy matches what we're trying to teach. Um, if you look at, at the range of media that are out there, uh, you know, books have been really great at conveying facts and information. Uh, film is really wonderful at uh, conveying stories, emotion, narratives, right? If you want to convince somebody about something or really get them in the gut, film is, and, and, and or, you know, video in general is a, is a great way to go. Games have a, have a different strength, and uh, one of that strengths is being able to articulate a system uh, because really when you break it down, games are a set of rules that you play. Uh, and when you look at a lot of government, by definition, it's a set of rules. So um, there is kind of a very nice uh, overlap between the two. We can model a lot of how government works through games. Uh, this lends itself to other topics like science, where there's also other uh, systems at work, whether they're physics systems which tends to be where all the commercial games are at. You throw a grenade and it has a certain arc and then, you know. So uh, we are focused on more social physics than physics physics. Um, but the, the ability to articulate those systems is, is, is pretty unique to games as a medium and we really try to make use of that in helping young people understand, well, how does our system of government actually work dynamically, not just in kind of a linear fashion when you read the story of how a, a you know, a bill becomes a law that gives you a certain perspective that also has a, a, often a ring of inevitability about it as opposed to the, all the could have beens and, and, and maybe should have beens when you, when, you, when you play it out yourself. Um, so the other thing that, that we have found is that games really help situate 
and, and this is actually what often draws, you know, that, that stuff about the systems and all of that is, is kind of very high flute and theoretical at, at a very gut level. And let me just very curious, just to do a quick check in, how many people here play games? Or, or would it, will it publicly admit to playing games? No, okay. Uh, and that would include games on your iPhone or, you know? All right, so a few were elected more hands. Um, you know, I mean, obviously what's attractive <coughs> about games at, at some level is also um, that, that they, uh, they give you the opportunity to try different things that you wouldn't do in real life. So, uh, for example, being able to be the president of the United States. Uh, you know, we can put you in that position and, and let you role play through that and make some of the decisions that you might make if you were president or a Supreme Court justice or a juror or, you know, uh, and some of these are, are less hypothetical than others. Um, so really being able to, to situate you in that position uh, and give you a simulation and, and the motivation that's tied up with it, you know, we found is actually really very uh, encouraging for young people. The other thing that we found is that, the, that young people are, are familiar with games and so um, being able to encounter the learning in a way that matches a form of, of expression and medium that they are, you know, kind of comfortable with and enjoy a lot uh, also has, has, has significant power. Um, so this is just a, a uh, uh, tes testimonial to, you know, kind of what teachers have found really valuable about games. I think what we have discovered also and, and is one of the things that's really important to us and I'm, I'm kind of backing into what iCivics does here, but you know, uh, the backdrop against which we're working is the fact that civics education has really declined as a focus of American education uh, since approximately the 60s, the 1960s. Um, really, uh, when the public schools were founded in the early 19th century, the, I the idea was actually to, the, the, the civic purpose of, of public schools were to train the next generation of citizens because there was a lot of concern that this new form of government that we had created, democracy or democratic republic, uh, was so new that it needed to be taught afresh to every new generation and there are all sorts of skills and, and knowledge and, and mindset that, that you need to have in order to carry out that democracy. That was really why we had schools and then over time that kind of slowly morphed as we more and more looked at preparing the workforce. That started happening in the early 20th century, so by the end of the 20th century we're pretty solidly, whenever you hear people talk about uh, public education is almost now exclusively about preparing workforce. Uh, that's not where we came from and I don't want to be entirely bound by history but something has been lost um, and we're, we're looking for a way to at least bring some of that back, you know, balanced with the recognition that yes, it is very important to prepare, prepare a workforce and the two actually are not in tension necessarily. Um, but one of the ways that we've been doing this, um, or one of the things that's happened is that civics is not um, is decreasingly a requirement, and those of you who might be familiar with school reform uh, know that uh, a lot of what's pushing school reform nowadays is the testing that a lot of you hear about or you probably have engaged in yourself, um, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger part of what's happening. But that, those testi that testing and that uh, quote-unquote accountability is, is increasingly centered on a couple of subject areas, specifically math and English, um, and that's therefore logically the money follows the accountability. So you're left with this entire other areas of arts and social studies, which are you know, kind of being pushed aside. We realize that one of the ways that we can get civics back onto the agenda is to make it relevant, fun, interesting, exciting, not just for the students, but for the teachers. So really developing these games in a way that we can get testimony like this so that, so that teachers are part of pushing it out and we're just bypassing schools altogether, going straight to the grassroots. Um, has been really, really effective. So making the games fun for the kids, you know, teachers really do want to see their, their students enjoying themselves and learning, um, but also we've made the games easy to fit into a, into, a, into a school, so they all, you know, are half an hour or less, or can be at least be played in half an hour or less, um, has, has been really critical to uh, pretty widespread adoption. And right now, we are being, uh, we, we have now 30,000 teachers registered on our site uh, with using a marketing budget of about zero dollars. So we've spread the word by word of mouth through teachers and, and it also kind of illustrates just how desperate social studies teachers are for any kind of content because they are so overlooked. Um, so we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't think it was effective and we do have some initial evidence. Uh, we've only been around for about three and a half, four years. So 
we're just now starting to, to do some various research on uh, effectiveness, you know, in terms of uh, basic knowledge of civics and getting uh, test scores up. But what we've definitely found is that the games, uh, you know, are, are nice standing alone, but they really work best with lesson plans around them. Um, you, you know, we know that the games are very good at conveying a couple of core concepts, but there's a lot of concepts around the game that you can get the wrong idea about because games always involve some amount of simplification. So making sure that those don't get picked up along the way is, is, is part of the learning. Um, this is a recent finding from uh, researchers at uh, Baylor in Texas, is that actually when, when they looked at the students and they were working with the Waco public school system, which is a very uh, diverse uh, and relatively low socioeconomic uh, community, uh, that, that we were seeing equal benefit across ethnicities, genders, and socioeconomic classes, which is uh, fairly rare in educational interventions. A lot of inter educational interventions tend to, unfortunately, widen the gap between achievers and, and the high achievers and low achievers. And, and so this was actually a pretty major uh, finding for us. And we have some theories about why that might be the case as far as, you know, again, games being accessible, especially to, to kids who might not otherwise be performing with, you know, traditional textbooks. Uh, but we're, we are looking for more research to, to look at that. Um, yeah, more, uh, more testimony here. And actually, this is from somebody who's teaching pretty advanced uh, is an AP government teacher. Um, so uh, again, the idea of here, the complexity is speaking to the kind of the ability to, to, um, to articulate a system rather than just a linear description of what's happening in our, in our polity. Um, you know, another important thing that we look at is are we engaging young people? So uh, this is pretty exciting uh, that actually, uh, this is our, again our most public game, do I have a right? Uh, in, in one of the first studies we did on this uh, almost uh, well, 57% of the kids who were playing the game in school ended up continuing to play it at home. And uh, when we first set out as an organization, we thought that uh, we might try to reach young people directly. We were, you know, when we were looking at how do we educate young people about the government, um, there was some you know, discussion of, well, you know, kids love video games. If you just make video games about the government, maybe they'll play that. And of course, that's in retrospect, so incredibly naive because our, our marketing budget of zero against Call of Duty's marketing budget of 10 trillion is just not a fair fight. However, we have found is, hey, if you introduce it in the classroom and, and kids get hooked, they, you know, they might actually go home and, and continue playing the game. And, and we do see that, and it's, it's a very exciting upshot of what we're doing. Of course, the other major reason why going through schools matters and why whenever you, you are looking at schools as an intervention in policy is that not everybody, but a very substantial proportion of, of young people go to school. If you wanted, if you just basically threw the game out there to the general public, you're going to get the Sesame Street effect, which is parents who are there monitoring their kids and, and doing, you know, making sure that the kids are playing educational games are, you know, not the kids who actually need this the most. Uh, interestingly, one of our kind of most rabid uh, um, uh, audience are uh, homeschool parents, which. You know, I don't, I don't know if, if anybody here was homeschooled. Uh, my my sister-in-law in law was homeschooled, and so I, I've tried to remove all stereotypes I have of, of homeschooling. But, you know, there is a stereotype of a political, political affiliation of homeschoolers and, and uh, you know, a hostility towards government, let's just say, because, you know, why you're not in school. But, um, uh, you know, it's actually, we've actually found that, no, they, they actually do uh, really want to teach about how government works. and. It's actually been really cool that the, when we ask for feedback from teachers, disproportionately we hear from homeschool parents, and so they are really engaged in the educational system. So that's actually really just generally exciting to me in terms of homeschooling in general, but also that that government matters to those parents. Um, uh, we had actually an earlier, some earlier conversations in the last uh, uh, lecture and conversation about well, how do you measure dispositions? Are we improving uh, not just student knowledge? about civics, and one of the other things we also care a lot about is, is helping develop some skills towards practicing civics, but um, you know, are, they, are they developing different attitudes, dispositions, feelings about government, and you know, one of the ways you get to that is asking students to keep journals, and you analyze the journals for how they're feeling, and, and you know, that, that's definitely uh, been borne out um, uh, through some of the research that we've been doing. Uh, and we're finding that actually things like uh, participation in student government uh, can increase after uh, introduction, after people start playing iCivics. 
Uh, we really want to get some more research on, on that so that it moves beyond the anecdotal, but all that is very promising right now. Um, uh, yeah, some more testimony here, including, the, again, the idea that the kids are going home and playing the game and having fun. Um, uh, this is actually maybe not a terribly surprising result, is that scores on reading and literacy assessment tests start to go up as well. Uh, the games, if you, how many of you actually had the chance to play the games on iCivics.org? Oh, great. Okay. It was an assignment. But uh, <laughs> um, you'll, you'll see right, a, right away when you're playing it that uh, there is actually an awful lot of reading and reading comprehension involved. Um, and I think what we, again, one of the attractive things about games and learning is instead of presenting it to you as a giant block that you have to absorb all at once, it's kind of pieced out in an actionable way so that the reading all has an immediate purpose. I'm reading this thing because I want to solve this question or problem. Um, and so the reading actually has a much more immediate purpose for the, for the people who are playing. So, uh, and also some of our games are, are very much explicitly about argumentation. So I, know there was, I don't think it was one of the assigned ones. Is Argument Wars is one of our uh, more popular games. And in that one, you uh, relitigate some key Supreme Court decisions historic Supreme Court decisions, uh, you can actually flip, you know, Miranda and, and, you know, a whole bunch of these cases. Um, and in that, you're not just obviously learning about uh, the, the content of, of what, you know, Miranda and search and seizure is all about, but also really learning about how do you use rhetoric, how do you argue, how do you use evidence, how do you counter-argue. Um, and so, you know, that's actually been not a surprising result, but it's, it's, it, it kind of validates some of, some of our secondary goals when we, when we set out to do this. Um, so uh, moving then on to a more general question about, well, what about games and you know, civic engagement and civil society as a whole, uh, I want to just put out a couple of ideas for fodder for conversation. Um, I don't know, I mean, knew this, that actually uh, for about a year, the White House had a czar for video games. Did anyone know this? No. Uh, Constant Steinkohler is a uh, scholar of video games, and uh, for years she was bizarre, uh, and, and brought in specifically to help the different agencies think through well, how can video games be you know used as a tool or inform the way you do things? And so I want to talk a little bit about what this medium might offer to civil society and politics. You know, the first one that's always obvious and first because for some reason we always go to it because we love educating people, is educating and shoving you know, new ideas down everybody's uh, heads. Uh, but, you know, to, but there actually is a lot of opportunity here uh, besides you know, what I just described. This, by the way, was something that was just tweeted out this morning uh, or this, yesterday evening. Um, these are two kids who uh, tweeted the fact that they had just won our Win the White House game. And they were so excited that they won that they took a picture of themselves winning and then tweeted it out to all their friends who, you know, of course responded, nerd, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, that was super, and they actually were like, yes, we are, uh, and that was really exciting to us because it was just like direct evidence, hey, these kids are actually playing this game. This game actually totally blew up right around the time of elections, as you might expect. Um, I ran some analytics on it, and there were more people playing this game than there were playing all of our games combined during school hours. So in other words, people were playing this game in huge numbers out of school. Uh, just, well, and it was obviously peaked at the election, but people really wanted to figure out what was going on and learn about the elections. And so this was a, a great way for, for people to do that. So if you haven't had a chance to check that one out, this clearly has a, a pretty strong following. It's called Win the White House. Uh, in any event, um, there is a, we're kind of in this second renaissance right now of educational games. Uh, the first that uh, the first wave when I was in mostly in elementary school and maybe in middle school was or junior high was what we called it at the time. Uh, you know the games like uh, Math Blaster and uh, um, uh, Oregon Trail, uh, where in the world is Carmen, Carmen San Diego, um, and uh, that kind of crashed and burned for some reason, <laughs> and we kind of had a second uh, resurgence with much more advanced concepts of, of video games and of education. Uh, and there was uh, a realization that good games actually are good learning. That is, when you are enjoying a game, 
what you're really doing is learning. And there's video game theorists who kind of lay this all out in, in some pretty actually readable uh, texts out there. Uh, one of them is Ralph Koster's Theory of Fun, where he lays out why are things fun. And the basic thesis is that what is fun is learning. And what you want to do is, in, in order to keep uh, people engaged in the game, is, is to walk that line between uh, too much challenge or frustration and boredom. Right? And anybody who's taught or learned, you know, if you've been sitting around in a classroom, those are the two poles you want to stay away from is, is like you know, going over everybody's head and everyone's just staring at you blankly or twiddling and doing something else because they're just totally bored. Um, I'm trying to get a feel for that right now, actually. <laughs> um, and the, ni the nice thing about uh, what, what this new technology, which, in which you're kind of always engaging in technology, is that there's a feedback loop that you can, with enough sophistication, work off of so that you're you know, always walking that line very carefully based on analytic feedback. So, you know, are you getting most of the questions wrong? Well, then let's back this up and ease it up a level. Are you getting them all right? Then I'm going to advance you to the next level and add another layer of complexity. Now you're ready for that second you know, layer of, of tools or whatever it is, uh, you know, or moving on to the next level with twice the number of enemies or whatever the, the case might be. Um, the way that a good game is structured is the way that good learning is structured. And, and when you really look at it, like games that people really like to play, there's two reasons. One is you're learning, or two, you're just like the rote mechanic of doing whatever the heck it is you're doing for some kind of immediate pleasurable hit. So those of you who's yourselves or your parents-in-law, specifically mothers-in-law or mothers, mother-in-law in my case, are addicted to Farmville or were addicted to Farmville, you know, it's obviously not much of a learning curve, but there is some you know, kind of pleasurable clicking going on there for some reason. Um, <laughs> Uh, another thing is the anywhere, anytime phenomenon. I mean, in theory, you can definitely, you know, not just play this in school, but go home and play it. And uh, right now, a lot of this is unrealized because um, I think, again, those who are playing at home are probably not the ones who really need to be playing it at home. Uh, and we really need to think about how do we leverage this more in a more egalitarian way. Um, but the promise is there for sure. Um, Another really important thing is scalable simulations. Uh, when you look at best practices in education, one of the best practices is, is not what I'm doing right now, uh, which is you know, kind of barfing up information that you'll hopefully write down and remember, but rather like actually engage everybody in doing something. Right? You know, whether it's project-based learning or simulations, having everybody actually do something is, is a lot more uh, engaging, interesting, educational, and, and have you know, better retention and better understanding than what I'm doing right now. So um, the problem is, and the reason why I'm not doing a simulation with you all, is that it involves incredible amounts of work to put together. Uh, and so uh, did anybody do a model Congress? Since I'm assuming you're all poli-sci nerds, no? No? OK. <laughs> I did. Uh, so you know, putting on one of those simulations is, is an, a, a vast amount of work. You have to, just think about it, you have to learn you know, the, the, all the procedures, Robert's Rules of Order or whatever, then you have to fill it up with content. And not only do you have to fill it up with content, but if you're designing a good simulation, then it can't be totally unfair. You, know, you actually have to balance the two sides of, uh, or three sides or whatever number of sides. And it actually takes an incredible amount of work. So um, I learned uh, negotiation uh, through Harvard's program in negotiations. And that's a, a game or simulation-based approach where you basically just negotiate, reflect, negotiate, reflect, negotiate, reflect. Those negotiations that they put together, those simulations were developed over decades where like every year they tweak a little bit, tweak a little bit, tweak a little bit until it's actually well balanced until they're pretty sure 95% of the time you're going to get the learning that you're supposed to get out of it. Uh, you know, we had a negotiation where there was no possible agreement to be had between two parties and you know, that, that had to be very carefully tweaked. Inevitably, 10% of the people always settled anyway, but you know, in theory, you're supposed to not be able to, to, to come to an agreement. So. Uh, the nice thing about putting those into a computer simulation is then you can actually scale the simulation and, and, and uh, be able to take the drudgery of one, memorizing all the rules as the umpire or judge, and two, uh, being able to actually create the simulation and run it without having to you know, do it yourself. Now, you, know, you can photocopy the simulation and whatnot, but it's just, there's just so much other skill that you need to do to be able to put on a simulation uh, that, that this is much more scalable than simply having people go out and do a simulation. Um, and to me, this, and I'll, I'll come back to this uh, a little bit later, to me one of the biggest uh, things that, that games can offer us in the, in, the, in the big picture in the long run is systems thinking. I touched on that before uh, in terms of the difference between games and other media 
as a, as a way to capture and, and convey a system. Um, but these are, these are increasingly important for us as a society to grapple with, that the, the, the things that we really need young people and, frankly, everybody to understand um, are how complex systems work. Uh, you know, if, if we really want to start talking about climate change, we really ought to understand how it's a system and not just kind of a linear, you know, oh, you know, climate change, bad, you know, which, you know, gets people mobilized, but maybe doesn't quite get people in a position where they can understand and figure out what the trade-offs are. Um, so there's, there's a, and I'll come back to this, but this, this is actually one of the, the really unique uh, affordances of, of this medium. Um, this is something I, I, I think is, is also under, right now underappreciated, is how uh, games can be laboratories for civil and democratic processes. Um, you know, I'll talk about bowling alone. Uh, but, you know, there is a lot of gaming that's happening together in social spaces. Uh, you know, maybe we don't have bowling leagues, but we have World of Warcraft guilds, and we have other places where people get together and, and they're playing games. Um, at a minimum, in those spaces, you're looking at emergent associations where you're practicing leadership skills. So in World of Warcraft, uh, you have groups of people who come together and do raids uh, in order to complete, you know, kind of epic level quests where you get whatever magic shield and helmet. Uh, so uh, in that process, you're also developing leadership skills, how to run a virtual team, which is essentially what they are. You know, when you talk to folks who are involved in, in, in these uh, massively multiplayer games, anybody here play any of those? Okay. So, um, you know, there, it's, it's basically like being in a sports league. I mean, you've got, you've got practices, you've got mandatory things you have to show up at, essentially all the things that you would get out of a bowling league and more, uh, especially as our, and, and yeah, I'm going to go back on the point I made before about workplace preparation. As our workplaces are increasingly virtual, except at Yahoo, you, you know, you, you're, these are really, really important skills for how to work together um, and also how to organize together. Um, and you know, we also are seeing inside these games efforts to create self-governance. So there is a um, there is a, a an online game called League of Legends, which is free to play, uh, but you pay money to upgrade things. And so there's a large incentive to have people really have a good time. And one of the big big problems of online games are that is that you know uh, a lot of people are just jerks. Just to that's the scientific concept, I guess. And so, like, there's a lot of people who just want to ruin your time there. Like, they're sore losers, or they're sore winners, or both. And, uh, you know, that's just not what the game developers want, is it just chases newcomers away. So, they've created a system of self-governance where, you know, you can rate your opponents, and then through various uh, kind of adjudicatory systems that are staffed by both, that are run by both staff and the players themselves, um, decide whether people should be banned from the game or, you know, various levels of, of, of penalties. You're, I mean, that's actually a very interesting, you know, emergent internal system of self-governance. Yes, it's within a corporate structure, uh, but it is still a, a practice of, of, of some form of self-governance. Um, and uh, at a much more the theoretical level, uh, you know, massively, these massive multiplayer games are, or even just even single-player games, uh, yes, it, I'll, I'll point out, yes, it's non-democratic, but these are still regimes. These are still sets of rules that in many ways you can look as iterating their way towards some form of justice. Uh, you, if you look at a lot of these games, there is a very, very strong feedback loop as to what is fair, what is just, and, and you know, you get to a lot of you know, almost Rawlsian concepts of, of how do you allocate resources to both newcomers and the existing people in such a way that everybody is happy because, you know, as with a democracy, uh, you can't have too many people drop out and stop participating because they feel that the system is fair. In their case, their interests are entirely commercial because this is their revenue stream. But um, how do you keep people feeling like the entire system is fair and, and, able, and also that the community is, is a, 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 you know, preferably not shrinking but maybe growing? Um, and the, these are these are actually uh, there's been a lot of economists who have been looking at uh, you know these the economies of these of these massively multiplayer games like how do currencies work within them. To me, the the vastly o overlooked and underdeveloped area of research here would be what's the political economy of these places. Like how do you determine what is fair and how do you 
create mechanisms to figure out what's fair. I mean, when you look at uh, how quickly some of these game developers will respond to, you know, you, they create a, uh, a shield that turns out to be too powerful, and suddenly this entire group of players who can use that shield are suddenly, too, as, a, as a group, too powerful. Then you've got to find some way to nerf what they call nerf it, so that, you know, that shield is no longer as powerful, or maybe the swords are now suddenly made more powerful so you can beat the shield, or whatever the case might be. Um, there is the actual balance itself, which is somewhat interesting, but then there's also looking at, well, how does that process work of feedback and fast iteration that gets to that fairness? And is there any way we can learn from that for our own democratic uh, self-governance? Um, again, yes, with the caveat that these are with, with totally different purposes uh, than, than our democracies. Mm. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that there is an opportunity there to look at living democratic labs, or, or at least distributionary labs. Um, and, you know, as I was doing more research into games and kind of teaching and learning, I also developed a certain skepticism towards what we can learn and teach people to do. Um, uh, you know, there's only so far that we can bend people's way of thinking as I was thinking about the systems thinking and realizing is it easier to get people to think about systems differently or simply change the way that they interact with those systems uh, and, and, and change behavior. So one of the things that, that I've now mentioned in, in every talk today was, you know, if we wanted more voting, would we, uh, would we be better off, you know, educating the hell out of everybody to say voting is really important and, you know, find a way to embarrass everybody to teach everybody to get everybody to, to vote, or just move election day to Saturday or declare it a national holiday and everybody gets the day off and you can actually go vote without having to take time off of work. And, I will put my money down on, on the ladder, right? So it's not every solution to every problem is education. Sometimes it's about changing the systems that we operate within. And so I think that there's opportunities to learn from how games work in, that, in, in, in looking at the interfaces that we have uh, in a number of different ways. Um, one is that, um, you know, this is actually a little project that I've done uh, back in, 2007 or 8 or so, uh, we were looking at urban design and there was specifically a one acre park that was being developed um, where uh, there was a strong interest in having the young people uh, of the neighborhood be involved in the design of what is essentially their own park and whenever you do an urban design charrette, you know, the last person you expect to show up is our young people. Actually, the last person you expect to show up is anybody. Really, because I mean, these 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 processes are so technical, and the jargon is so thick that really nobody knows how to participate in them. You know, except for other you know urban designers, architects. You know, so we were trying to figure out a way to make it a lot more accessible, and we used uh, what at the time was a really popular virtual world interface, Second Life, uh, which is sort of a video game with the game removed. Um, but really trying to figure out, can we use this as a space to design? in this kind of rapid prototyping way, uh, have young people express, well, here's how I would like the space designed, and they could just move all the little pieces around very quickly. Uh, and that was kind of interesting, and then we realized, well, what was missing from all of this is, well, how do you actually experience this thing that you've just designed? And that's where we got to really using the idea of games, which is on the next iteration, um, uh, I was no longer part of the team, but my partners went on to um, basically drop little games into the design. So, you then had to experience your own design by playing the role of uh, someone in a wheelchair who needed to go through the park to get to the other side, somebody with a dog, uh, you just wanted to walk the dog, somebody with kids who were going to go play, and then actually experience the, the park in that embodied role. And, and basically you had a game to play, like you had to successfully complete that quest, and then you were able to evaluate that space from that perspective. So that was just one you know, very specific way that we were using uh, the concept of games and gaming uh, for a form of democratic participation. Um, uh, there's, there's other ways uh, that, um, that you can think about it, and one is that you know, games uh, are, have been, you know, and, and since I started researching and, and thinking about this area, uh, Jay McGonigal coined the term gamification, which is now kind of the, the uh, bane of every, gamer's exist of every game developer's existence. But, um, in other words, the concept that you can apply gaming concepts to everyday life. So, 
if you find your job boring, maybe you'd find it less boring if, you know, every five minutes you got a little ping and then, you know, as the more work you do, you level up and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's, I'm giving the most cynical spin you could possibly put on this. Um, but, you know, done right, games are motivating uh, or can, be, can boost existing motivations. Um, and there's different ways in which you can think about how game design uh, or some of the techniques of game design uh, can, can get there. So um, there is, uh, for example, uh, uh, Thaler and Sunstein's uh, concept of libertarian paternalism where you, know, you, you acknowledge everybody makes choices, but you can change the way the choice is presented so that it you know, leans you towards what is, quote unquote, the better choice. Because if you think about it, every way that you present the choice is always going to be biased in some way. So why not bias it towards the one that we, you know, we think is better for them? So the there was an example that they gave in their book, uh, what was it called, Nudge, where uh, there was a dangerous curve in Chicago um, where you can put up a billion signs and say, dangerous curve, slow down. Um, in other words, you can try to educate drivers as they approach the dangerous curve, and none of it really worked. And the way that, the, that they ultimately figured out a way to get people to slow down was to paint the lines closer and closer and closer together so it gave you the illusion that you were speeding up as you were approaching the curve, so you naturally just slowed down. Uh, classic game design technique, right? I mean, that's, that's just straight out of video games. That's actually how you produce the, the, the illusion of motion in a video game. That's a really trivial example, but, um, you know, I, I think that when you look at uh, even just how things have, without, before the term gamifi gamification was coined, you know, credit card companies gave, and, and airlines would give you points for doing things. And, you know, I, I know a lot of people who choose their airlines strictly on the basis of, of earning those points. Um, even if you did the math, it didn't quite work out for you, uh, at least not for me. But, um, but it, it's there and it drives, it drives behavior. Can we do that in other areas of, of, um, of society? And um, to me, I think those, uh, those, new, those techniques uh, are, are, you know, we really have to think about them uh, in terms of, uh, I'm going to just lay out these four challenges again as, as food for thought. This is from my previous lecture on more, this was more focused on civic education and civic engagement, but I think these intersect uh, very importantly, at least that's the work that I'm trying to do, um, is the first, uh, is, the, is the filter bubble, which probably a lot of you are familiar with from Eli uh, Pariser, uh, the awareness that our technology, when, when the internet was first introduced, there was a utopian vision that we'd somehow all, you know, sing Kumbaya together because we'd all be talking to, uh, you know, Kenyans and, and everyone around the world, and we'd all come to understand each other, and you know, liberals and conservatives, uh, you know, dogs and cats living together, blah blah blah. But in fact, uh, the technology is is pretty much now working against that because uh, I've admitted this over and over again today, today, like an alcoholic, like I get all my news from Facebook, you know, and so what is Facebook giving me is basically all what my friends think is interesting. What do my friends think are interesting? Well, basically, you know, the same things. Uh, am I getting the opposing point of view uh, only occasionally? So, um, uh, so this is this is something that is is uh, from a civic engagement and 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 civic uh, education perspective. A huge challenge that we're facing is the fact that our natural foibles towards uh, kind of confirmation bias are now even further reinforced by the technology that we're using, because it's in the interest of Google to do this. It's in the interest of Facebook to do this. I mean, would you rather? Read things that make you happy or things that piss you off. Uh, you know, I'll tell you which one will make them more money. So um, that's that's one challenge. Um, uh, in civic education, we face another challenge, which is um, that uh, we increasingly find that it's hard to broach controversial topics. Um, there. We want to make schools into, you know, uh, not just nonpartisan places, but people have now started to re essentially redefine nonpartisan as nonpolitical uh, altogether. Um, and I, sh I think I shared this in, in the last talk, but one, one, my uh, director of curriculum at iCivics had been a, a middle school teacher in Washington, D.C. in a almost, uh, you know, it was like 90% plus African-American school. Uh, she has her own political leanings, uh, and uh, in the 2008 election, she was trying to teach about the election and trying to present both candidates. Uh, I'll just say that, you know, not, not having inquired too deeply, that 
chances are really, really high that she would basically voted for the same candidate that all the, you know, the, the students' parents would have. Um, but she was just trying to present both candidates and was uh, almost immediately hit with charges of racism uh, and was called into the principal's office and basically learned a lesson, don't talk about this stuff. Um, and this is you know, one example, but it, it, we hear this over and over and over again in schools across the country. And as you know, what's being called the big sort is working its way out so that our communities are getting more and more homogenous ideologically it's becoming an even bigger problem because there isn't, you know, within that same community or that same school, uh, you know, uh, necessarily the other point of view being represented if you were to have a conversation within the class that just said, well, you guys talk amongst yourselves. So uh, this is a challenge, and I think this is especially a challenge in the sense that, uh, you know, Keith and I were talking about the fact that, uh, generally speaking, you don't get people to vote abstractly. You know, the idea of civic education is, is, all, is, is is itself sometimes if you look at it kind of odd like it, it gets it tends towards the civic religion stuff like you should vote because it's good um, but when you look at what motivates people to vote or to get involved it's actually because you have a stake in things you actually care about the issue uh, you you're supporting it you not you don't vote generically I mean people do I mean empirically people vote because they feel like they have to vote but most people vote because they're supporting Obama Romney um, you know they're actually out there on with a particular point of view. So we're kind of at a paradox with, with civic education. How do you get young people excited and engaged with these issues while at the same time we're increasingly depoliticizing schools? Um, and uh, so it's, it, it's, it's kind of a, a challenge that we're working our way through. Um, the, other, the other challenge we're facing is, uh, is the fact that the science of manipulating opinion is fast outpacing our the science of understanding how to you know reason logic and maybe resist manipulation so the example I give here is uh, basically what I had been doing before going on iCivics which is uh, I was managing the, the strategy the strategic clients uh, for blue state digital uh, in, in Washington DC so all the clients who we were working with there um, and Blue State Digital is probably best known for providing the technology and also a lot of the personnel for both Obama campaigns. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, just objectively speaking, Obama just totally destroyed Romney on was, was smart use of, you know, kind of a more scientific approach to outreach and, and mobilization. So um, what, the, what the teams were very, very good at doing was doing little, little experiments over a large uh, numbers of people to iterate their way from, you know, one form for getting people to donate money. Eventually, they, you know, through little, little experiments, they worked their way away to this form. And they increased their donations by 5%. 5% doesn't sound like a lot until you start multiplying that against the billions of dollars that were being raised. Um, and then, of course, this is only one of many, many experiments that, that, that the organization was running. Uh, in some ways, you're almost skipping over the cognitive theories of what the hell's going on here, right? I mean, like maybe there is some theory behind why this is a better form than that, but who cares? Because this empirically works. What are we doing on the other side of this? How much research is going into um, helping people think clearly for themselves, uh, think about uh, making decisions uh, and being rational in the face of this unrelenting and now increasingly data-driven to the point of subconscious Manipulation, you know, we were all worried about subconscious ads, uh, you know, when television first came out, and we were at the point where this is now being driven by data. We know if this ad is causing you to click. We know if we're raising five percent more money, and the the millions of dollars being spent on the campaigns, and this is just the presidential campaign. You have to multiply that out by all the various other campaigns across the country is being dwarfed by the com commercial interests who are are doing the same thing. Uh, at tens or hundreds or thousands of times of dollars invested. And I can tell you the research budget on the flip side, uh, because I'm constantly looking for, as you mentioned, money for my organization, the amount of money that's out there to research how do we teach people to, quote unquote, what used to be called media literacy. I mean, what I see out there right now is, as the curriculum for media literacy is responding to an early 2000s media literacy. They're not even thinking about this. This is not even on the radar. There's zero dollars being spent on this right now. And even if you took all the money out there for research to, to put against this, 
it's it's being dwarfed, uh, especially because these guys don't have IRBs to report back to. They just do whatever the hell they want to, and they they, they move that fast. Um, so, you know that that's that's another major challenge that we're facing here. Um, and then I'm going to come back to this uh, about uh, you know just how we think about uh, systems, how we think about interconnectedness in the world, and you know this may not exactly be the best example as I as I think about it, but um, you know we have. In, we have our, our unconscious biases. We have the way that our brains are, are wired. Uh, we have biases towards our tribal affinities rather than towards you know global humanity or, or whatever you might want to call it. Um, and there is, I have some hope that new media, and it's still utopian, but I have some hope that because, for example, games are able to elevate systems up and and. Uh, in the, in the broad picture, maybe even show you the moral values behind those systems. That's really, to me, the, the greatest aspiration that, that games can reach to. That, um, that we, can, we can maybe help overcome some of the problems we have right now with systems thinking. In other words, understanding that when uh, we set up our policies in a particular way, uh, eventually 20, 50, 100 years from now, entire nations are going to go underwater. Um, or uh, if we can't do that, if we can't educate people using these new media, then maybe we can surface uh, those consequences at the point of your behavior uh, in, in the way that, uh, you know, Theo and Sons are, are talking about in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, libertarian paternalism. Uh, maybe there's a way we can redesign the way we make choices, learning from the way games work to get us to think, or, or more importantly, not even think, but just behave differently at the point of, of, of choice. Um, I, I just pulled out this example because it's just obviously so of the moment. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously the, the, what happened in Boston is, is uh, on everyone's minds, and, and this started making the rounds, I think, last night. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how many of the people who are circulating this, uh, these, these sets of photos on Facebook kind of detect the, the very sharp, stinging irony of these, of these photos. The fact that uh, we don't do this every single time there's a bombing in Afghanistan, or as there have been you know, all week and all around the world, uh, there's no outpouring of empathy and sympathy from America to the rest of the world. Um, how, how, do we, how, do we, how, do we, how do we reverse that? Right? I mean, that was the original, you know, one of the, one of the big utopian premises of the internet was that we would start developing this empathy. Um, and, I, and I think I do see some of that on a case-by-case -case basis, but the question is, is it happening at a scale and, uh, and, and breadth? wide enough to actually address the, the, the very real issues that we saw that we were facing. Um, when I looked at how people were responding to this, it was largely without recognizing kind of what I see is, I see at least is a fairly bitter irony here about, you know, it's only the, 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 the Afghanis are, are trying to model for us the, the empathy that they would like to see from us, maybe just a little bit of. Um, so that's, that to me is, is really, the, the biggest moral challenge we face is that the moral questions of the 21st century and beyond are, are, are not the, the ones that we were necessarily equipped for genetically, biologically, uh, in terms of, of, of being able to, to cooperate within our tribes with something you know, that turns out increasingly as we're doing the cognitive science research is, is actually to some degree, and, and anyone who's a cognitive scientist is going to, you know, uh, completely reject this term, but we can use it anyway. We're essentially hardwired, where right? we have uh, some basis in our biology of, of how our brains are wired to be able to, you know, have those responses to each other face to face. Uh, we're willing to do things to each other globally that we're not willing to do to each other face to face. Um, and I just put it out there: Is there something that new media can do for us to either help us think differently or feel differently, much more to the point, um, or maybe at least make us feel like we are face to face when in fact we're not and maybe overcome some of that uh, just purely bias that we, that we have because there is no reason why a life here is worth more than a life in Afghanistan at least if you're in, at least in a non-capitalist analysis of, of the, the moral meaning of a life. Um, so I just put out uh, those four uh, challenges as well as the, um, you know, the kind of these three possibilities uh, for discussion or we could talk about something else if you like. Uh, um, so I throw it back to you. I'll leave you actually, I'll leave it with I'll leave it with Justin O'Connor's uh, overall kind of statement of our of of, of why we exist uh, <coughs> to uh, open up the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.
time for a few questions. So, Jim, yeah, uh, do you want me to call or? Yeah, please do. Okay, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a totally biased picker, of, 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 so I'll just go with whoever I see first. So. You mentioned New Media um, several times. What are you doing in New Media to try to drive tra traffic to your site? Uh, we use Google's ingenious Google Ads, uh, which they give away for free to nonprofits. And uh, some, I'm assuming they're getting a tax write off on, on things that are actually give, generating more profits for them, which is kind of amazing. But uh, yeah, we use that, but also significantly word of mouth. Half of our teachers find out of us through word of mouth. So that's not necessarily new media, that's just that's not new word of mouth. But it's not like Facebook banner ads or hashtags that you control or anything. Uh, you know, uh, we're, I'm looking at how you might we might be doing more aggressive uh, social media type things, which is kind of something I'm relatively knowledgeable about. But we've actually been able to get to 30,000 teachers without that, so it's kind of amazing. Yeah. Is there a game about the tax system? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, not about the tax system per se, but we do have a game called the People's Pie, where you're trying to balance the federal budget, and taxation is a piece of that. Uh, and it's an extraordinarily frustrating game for anybody who wants to try to go about the federal budget. <laughs> yeah. Have you overcome the barriers to uh, technology and access to technology that, uh, you know, because your game's going to serve a lot of people, especially from the lower income communities, how do you kind of bridge that gap? Yeah. So our games are designed to be used in, in different kinds of environments. You can uh, certainly play them one-to-one, -one, but what we found is that, you know, a lot of schools just don't have even after all these decades, don't have that capacity. So um, we, we've made it able, you can actually play our games uh, with it uh, like this. Uh, like I, you can project the game and then everybody in class can play collaboratively. But actually in some ways that's a better way to play the games. Um, and uh, we're even starting to offer the games on CD or USB sticks if your internet connection sucks. Yeah. So you, uh, you mentioned a bunch of these other games like uh, World of Warcraft. That teach the lessons that you want to teach, it seems, some of them about self-governance. And so is there any reason why you stick with the format you do? I mean, in your games, you have a judge and you have lawyers. Yeah. I mean, you could just as easily have zombies mm -hmm. trying to work the tax system. Um, yep. I just pick tax system randomly when I think of zombies. But you, zombies could, you, mean, right? yep. you could send it on another planet. You could have uh, you know, people that you shot at. And, yeah. uh, so you could abstract the lessons away Absolutely. from the format. I mean, you stick with a very conventional format yeah. of sorts. Yeah, we do. I, is I'll, there a reason I'll, for totally, that? I'll totally go with that. I, I, you know, one is uh, when we actually started out, uh, we we had this notion of creating a, a, a massively multiplayer game. It was going to be called. Uh, we actually do actually ultimately did have a game called Lawcraft, but uh, we, it was it was going to be something like Law World or whatever, and then you were supposed to have their Shield of Justice. And, I don't know, whatever. All that, all these metaphors. Uh, and you're supposed to go out and you know, civilize or something the land. Uh, besides the fact that you can only stretch a metaphor so far, uh, and the budget was going to be ludicrous for that, plus the amount of, of, of um, marketing it would take to actually getting traction. Uh, and trying to, if, if on the other hand you're trying to do what we're doing now, which is to, is, is to leverage a classroom as a really almost direct and, and frankly a very democratic, uh, in the sense of, of or universal platform then trying to fit that into a classroom is almost impossible because uh, classrooms, for better or for worse, except in Montessori schools and, and the like, are very, you know, you have to hit a certain number of standards in a given semester or else you haven't done your job as a teacher. So they're fitting what we're trying to do within that constraint of the market is, was, was an extremely difficult thing to do. Now, that said, one of the things that is in kind of in my long-term vision of what I'd like to see is to then you know, right now we, we have a gamification layer on our games. You earn points, you earn um, badges and whatnot for playing these games. What I, what I really would love to see is, is actually um, being able to create like something like a, a shared Sim City across a class where the entire class uh, takes responsibility. It's almost like a class pet for the city and everybody plays a different role. And different issues arise over the course of taking care of the city that happen to hit all of the standards as you go along. But it feels more like it's being driven by the city. Things are happening, you know, fires are burning or whatever. So you're getting a little bit of both. But the, the difficulty of, of trying to compare something like the, uh, you know, the learning that you get from an MMO and the learning that you get in the classroom is can you guarantee that that's going to happen for everybody who's playing that game? It's a little bit like clinicals versus uh, simulations. Like in a clinical, uh, let's say in law school, 
what clients are you going to see? You can't guarantee that every client, I mean, I've heard of clinicals where every client came in and then never came back again, and you're like, well, I didn't learn anything this semester. And that's just the way that it goes, uh, because it's, re it's reality. Versus, I can give you a simulation and guarantee you that you'll hit these three issues. Then that may not be a real client, but you will hit those issues. And so, right now, uh, you know, predictability is, is, is what we're optimizing for. Long answer. Uh, can I run over? Or we, uh, well, the pizza will get cold, Gene, I know. and you'll be responsible. So, <laughs> so I think, how about one more question? All right. Sounds very democratic yes. decision making here. Do we have one back there? Oh. <laughs> uh, my question was mainly just about, you know, the game seems mainly aimed, aimed at like elementary school um, kids and younger ones, but how do you continue this sort of learning for maybe kids once they get into high school or you know, once they continue yeah. on to continue civics? Right, so so actually they're aimed at middle school and, and so they're, they're geared at the seventh grade reading level and we have, we have been finding teachers adapting them for, for high school and, and even junior college. Um, you know, I, I think what we would, actually it's a struggle for us to bring the, con it's actually often the content as well as some of the complexity to a middle school level. So it actually would be fairly easy to take off like all the safeties and, and, and so for example in, in Win the White House, purely on a content level, we, you know, don't have certain issues introduced for, you know, either elementary school or, or, or middle school so we don't really do, uh, uh, I, I forget if we did abortion at all, but I think we don't do, um, you know, gay marriage and whatever for different age groups. And of course, you can always, as a teacher, decide whatever. Um, uh, but in terms of the complexity and, and the level of thinking, frankly, I actually think that, that uh, kids are astonishingly good at, 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 these, at these systems. Uh, and so, you know, for us to actually keep up with high school level complexity is, is probably going to be a challenge to think about how to make the, the, the complexity of what we're representing closer to reality rather than just the content and the reading level, which of course is a natural thing that we would do to scale up. Thank you all. Thank you.